Hello everyone and welcome to our professional development webinar series. Thank you for joining us for author and blogger Sarah Reinhardt's presentation, Supporting Motherhood, Facing the Challenges from a Parish Perspective. For those of you who are here with us for the first time, my name is Jared Dees. I'm the Digital Publishing Specialist at Ave Maria Press, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. This webinar is brought to you exclusively by Ave Maria Press, in partnership with the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the National Federation of Priests Councils. Everyone in our audience is muted today, but you are welcome to ask questions. Questions can be sent to our presenter through the questions section of the GoToWebinar panel, which you will see displayed here. Please take a moment now to find the box for typing questions on your GoToWebinar panel. Simply click the Send button on the bottom right corner to send your question to our presenter, and I will read as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentation today. I would also like to note that the webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be sent to you later this week via email, so please watch your inboxes. Now that we've gone through all of our technical information, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our presenter, Sarah Reinhard. Sarah is a popular Catholic writer, blogger, and contributor to such sites as CatholicMom.com, The Integrated Catholic Life, The New Evangelizers, and Amazing Catechists. She pr produces a weekly segment on Mary for iPadre, Catholic Foodie, and Uncommon Sense Podcasts. In addition to serving as editor of her parish publications, Reinhardt has served in varying capacities within the parish staff, from secretary and administrator roles to ministry scheduling and formation coordination. She's the author of five books for Catholic families and writes a monthly column in the Diocese of Columbus's The Catholic Times. She also contributes a weekly column on the Catholic Writers Guild blog. Reinhardt holds master's degrees in marketing and communication and has worked for many years in corporate and nonprofit organizations. She lives in central Ohio with her husband and three children. Sarah, welcome. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Jared. It's great to be here. I'm going to hand over presentation to you now. Okay. Wonderful. All you. Is it showing up? It is now, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And, you know, the weirdest part about this for me is that I'm sort of looking at a blank wall and not hearing anything, so it's like I'm talking to myself. It's very much like producing a podcast segment. So, hello and welcome. I know you're all out there. I'd like to start today with a prayer because we're Catholics and we're talking about motherhood, and I can think of no better two reasons to, for a topic that needs us to start with prayer. So let's start in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we ask you to guide us today and help us as we talk about our role in parishes and supporting the role that is so very dear to your heart. We bring our intentions before you, and we ask you in a special way that your mother Mary walk with us today. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as Jared told you, and I'm sure you knew already, you are here today because I am giving you a presentation on supporting motherhood, facing the challenges from a parish perspective. And as you heard in my bio, I have some experience within a parish setting. But I would like to introduce you to the real me. And that is the me you see pictured here with the lovely people who are part of what make me who I am. And I'd like to note that that is Our Lady of Guadalupe on the wall. And right underneath that is my oldest daughter and then my two youngest children sitting on my husband's lap. I've been a parish employee for almost nine years. And that's just after I married my husband, I made the move from sort of a corporate life to a parish life and was shocked at how similar and dissimilar they are. Um, I have a background in education. My bachelor's degree is actually an education degree. And 
I also have a master's degree in marketing communications, as Jared shared. I've listed here a number of ways you can get in touch with me if you are so inclined. I write most every day over at my blog, snoringscholar.com. I'm on Twitter. I have a Facebook page. You'll find me pretty regularly over at catholicmom.com. And I also have my email address there. Um, I know a lot of people still prefer to use email, and I'm, in fact, one of them. So I invite you, if you do have questions that don't get answered or you have other requests of me, please feel free to reach me in any of these ways. So like every good mom, oh, ah, here we go. We have a plan for the day, our to-do list. Um, we're going to start off talking about what I see as the mom's challenge list. I'm going to share with you a little catchphrase that I hope will help you as you deal with mothers in your parish, the power to say no with the resources to say yes. I'll share some tips, some resources, a few more ideas on this topic of involving mothers and working with mothers, and then we'll have the best part of the presentation will be your questions, I'm sure of that. So I look forward to, to talking with you. So let's start off with a mom's challenge list. As I was thinking about this, I actually put this out on Facebook as well and uh, was a little bit overwhelmed by some of the things people see as their top three challenges as mothers. Uh, we got into some definite theoretical, theological, and ex existential conversations. I tend to be more of a practical, practical sort of girl on this sort of thing. The first thing I see as a parish employee myself is that everybody's busy. This is true in my own life, too, and I'm sure it's true in your life. Uh, whether it's mom, dad, the kids, there's, there just simply is not time for one more thing. Another common concern is I'm doing this alone. And I say this, either parent could be saying this, I'm speaking obviously for mothers first and foremost, but um, I feel this way a lot because my husband has to work long hours. So by the time he gets home, there's not time to do evening things. Um, I'm sort of flying solo with the kids a lot. Which brings me to the next point. What do I do with the kids? There are people who aren't necessarily comfortable with child care options. Sometimes there aren't good child care options. Sometimes the kids have so much going on, you need somebody to run them around. And then there's the extra expenses. And I think this is something that's hidden as we work with mothers in our parishes, these extra expenses that we maybe unintentionally ask them to bear at times. And it's something I think we need to be mindful of. So as we look at this challenge list, and as I was reflecting and praying about how working with mothers and dealing with these challenges, I came up with this idea um, that I've seen work in our parish. And it, it involves the power to say no with the resources to say yes. And I think it's something as parish employees we need to keep in mind. The moms you work with have to know they can tell you no. Granted, that's true for everybody, but I think especially the moms. They have to know, first of all, that you support them because the most important work they do is their work and their vocation as mothers and possibly as wives. But and this is, this is something that comes from my marketing background and also from my background in parish work. People don't want to say no, and sometimes they will avoid you if they think you're going to ask them a question that's going to make them say no. I mean, what kind of a jerk are you if you tell your parish that, no, I can't do that? So that brings it around to the second part of this, which is giving them the resources to say yes. That's almost a trust issue. What can you provide for them? How can you equip yourself as a parish to help them succeed so that this yes becomes another yes? Let's talk first about the power to say no. I have actually advised a number of moms in my parish to say no to things. And I've done this because I see that the work they're doing is important, and it's also invisible. And that's why I think a lot of people feel guilty about it, too, because when I'm at home changing diapers, washing dishes, it's lonely, it's, 
it's frustrating. Um, and But I think they don't step forward because they don't always know that they can say no. And I've noticed in our parish, and we have a very small parish, so I have to remind the people I work with that this is true of parishes around the country because I know I've talked to people from many larger parishes and parishes similar size as ours, that there are less and less people to volunteer. But that doesn't give us permission as parish employees to overtax the people who do say yes. So we have to tap into what's already going on into the mom's life. Does she have a certain amount of free time, perhaps already in her day? Is she already involved with a certain ministry that it makes sense to see her help with something else? Don't call and assume a yes. And I'm not saying that you call and do that, because I know certainly in our parish we don't. But it seems to come to my mind that there are times that I feel that. The person asking me sort of assumes that I'm going to say yes. And that, that's something to keep in mind as we ask people. And then the other side of it, and I think this is where, as, as a parish, we can encourage prayer, and not just about, can you help with this ministry, but pray about it, discern if this is right. Now, giving her and yourself the resources to say yes. I have a rule in my own volunteering within the parish. Only ask once. So if I have asked someone to help me with something, I don't ask them for anything else again. Now, before you shake your head and throw things at your computer monitor at me, I know how unrealistic that is. But that's sort of a mental stepping point that keeps me from asking Janice over and over and over. It keeps her from hating to see my name come up on her phone or in her inbox. Another thing is to offer to help that person. Anticipate what help she needs and then actually do it. Be a resource for her. Be someone who helps her. Child care is something that may or may not be realistic to offer, but I have seen it so many times in my own involvement where I'm not able to help because there's no, what do I do with the kids? We go back to that mom's challenge list. What do I do with my kids? So offer child care every time. It's a way you offer to help. And then get beyond your church doors. So often it's so easy to sit. For me, the church doors, I work from home, so my church doors are actually a keyboard and a screen. But we need to get beyond that. We are the body of Christ. We are sometimes the only Jesus people see outside of Mass. They need to see us. They need to see the whites of our eyes. They need to hear our voice. Sometimes that's hard and it takes extra effort and we are already overworked and I know it. But this is something that I think we need to prioritize as parish and as family, is getting beyond our church doors. A few tips. It's hard, and I, as I came up with these tips, I'm in a unique position. I have very young children, so it's hard for me to leave home. In fact, um, my office door was just helpfully opened by someone who's much shorter than me, who is pipe poking her head in to see who I was talking to. Um, and <laughs> here we are using multimedia resources, which is my first tip. But I so miss hearing my pastor's voice in his Bible studies. Now, he's put together some DVDs that I think are wonderful, and he's got a YouTube channel. And I think this is a way we can use media to reach into people's homes, to help feed them, if you will. It gives us a chance to reach some of the moms at a time when it's convenient for them. Another opportunity when we're talking about multimedia resources is Skype. I know, I've heard Lisa Hendy say repeatedly, and she actually sent me an email and confirmed it, she has been a guest in people's book studies. They, they Skype up with her, and she will talk with them and pray with them. And that's a way. Who's to say your pastor couldn't Skype up with a mom's group or with a group? He's not available to go there. But you could be tapping into the resources within your parish, the people within your parish, maybe even other people 
to meet and to pray together and to be face to face in a way that you're not face to face when you're just typing. Encouragement is huge. I know as a mom myself, and I've had one of these days actually today, so I'm, I'm speaking from a, a really tender place when I say that there are times when you don't know the difference you make when you just tell somebody, thanks, you're doing a good job, or you know you're really making a difference in this. I think moms especially need encouragement, whether they're in their home, whether they're grandmothers, whatever kind of moms they are, we need to encourage them from our parish offices, from our parish standpoint, to let them know how much we appreciate the role they play. And the other thing is to write thank you notes. And make this your habit, not the exception. Whether you write them on email or you write them handwritten, I don't know that it necessarily matters, but it definitely lays a groundwork for appreciation. And I think appreciation is something that when I see people stomping away from parishes, it's usually not because they feel appreciated. So I think it's important to recognize our parish offices could not run if it wasn't for the people who make them that way. Granted, I'm preaching to the choir here, and I realize that. I was trying to think of a good resource list, and uh, as I typed this up, I, I kind of chuckled at myself and thought, boy, I sure am towing the party line here. And that is completely unintentional. First of all, I think the number one resource you have are the women in your parish. Nobody's going to minister better to those other moms than the moms who exist and the women who exist within your parish, whether it starts in your parish office or grassroots at a lower I don't even want to stay lower level, but the women in your parish are an untapped resource. And maybe they are tapped, but maybe there are some jewels. There, I guarantee there are some jewels within it. Tap into those women in your parish. Get their insight. Involve them. Ask them to help you involve them. Another great website is catholicmom.com. And there's a reason Ave Maria has, has a line of books related to this, and it's because it's a fabulous website. I actually spent an inordinate amount of time this weekend online trying to find other Catholic websites for moms, and um, none of them were worth sharing. So I really have to say CatholicMom.com is really great. We've also got Lisa Hendy's book here, a, Catholic, a Handbook for Catholic Moms. And yes, I put the plug in for my own book in part because when I wrote it, I was so struck with the idea that I was going to help moms prepare for baptism during pregnancy. And I wrote it after my third child had been baptized. So this, the preparing for baptism at the level that I share in the book is something that I didn't necessarily do as a complete program. But I think it's something that as parishes we could definitely put to use. And I hope more moms and more families are able to use that. Moms need other moms, and I say this as someone who never thought I would be in the club of moms, but I have so many moms who have helped me and who continue to help me. Today I can think of my husband's mom is out corralling my kids so that I can be sitting here with the headset on talking to you. So, And she's been a great inspiration and example to me. Older moms, moms who are my age and know exactly where I am in my mothering career, if you will. And then there's the younger moms who I've turned into the example for. I'm not someone who has sisters, but I've watched my husband's sisters as they interact and grow from each other. And I've seen the change in women and in the relationships between women when one woman turns into a mother, like she sort of quote unquote joins the club. And it's a beautiful thing. And I think as parishes, we all know this. Everybody listening to this is nodding and going, you didn't tell me anything new, Sarah. I know. I'm not telling you anything new. But I hope you recognize this. Moms need other moms. And as parishes, we need to minister to these moms. They're, they're carrying the world for us. Not to say anything bad about men either. Um, but one particular way we can minister to moms is with small groups. Within our own parish, um, I guess it was about eight and a half years ago, they started a mom's group, and it was a particular program. 
and everybody was sort of, well, we'll see how this goes. We had a couple of women who had gone to another parish and participated in the program. And they came back and they were all on fire and our pastor said, yeah, sure, start it. It started with, I think, nine women and it grew to where it involved 50. Now we're only a parish of, right now we have 300 families. Back then I think we had about 250. So we're very small, but that group, those 45 to 50 women over the course of three or four years changed our parish. They transformed what was happening. All of a sudden, I saw these deep connections between women. And I also observed a different level of practicing the faith. And I think what happened, because I was actually a part of one of the groups, and I did not, I actually didn't care for it, the um, material that was presented, but the bonding that happened through that shared experience, the ability that people felt that they could trust, that they could be open, it really did something to foster community within our parish. And I think that is something that women in particular long for. And I saw it do really good things in our parish, and it continues to do good things in our parish. So I guess that's sort of an anecdotal, an anecdotal story. That said, I think it also bears, it, there are many other programs out there that are based on the small group model. So as we talk about fostering community using the small groups, I mentioned it before and I'll come back around to it, using multimedia, and by multimedia I don't just mean computers. It doesn't have to have a keyboard, it doesn't have to have a screen. Phone calls, the old telephone, is amazing how many people will avoid making phone calls now and text instead. But when you have a nice phone call, how can that change your day? How does it impact the kind of day you have or the kind of experience you have when you hear someone's voice? Another thing to keep in mind with mothers in particular is that we are naturally service oriented. It's what we do with every meal we give our children and our families. So if you're doing something service oriented, there's going to be a natural appeal to moms and it's going to speak to something in them. So how can you serve within your parish and your community or your larger area? Another thing I've seen work well on the side of fostering community and small groups are having small prayer chains and small prayer groups. When you're meeting each week or at a set time to pray together, it, there's something intimate about praying together. It's like eating together which is what we do at Mass, right? A version of eating, and we pray together at Mass. So we're taking some of those elements and we're integrating them, and it just, I, I think it does really great things in our parishes, and it speaks particularly well to mothers. And another thing, it's not on the slide here, but inviting other Christians to participate. They certainly don't hesitate to invite us, and I think that speaks well of them. We should be inviting them as well. Maybe we don't invite them to Mass because we have some weird up-down, up-down things. Although, I don't discourage it. But why not have small groups that can involve those other Christians in your area? We all have friends who aren't Christian. Our only friends aren't Catholic. So let's foster community in a larger Christian sense as well. All too often, I want to make things complicated and this presentation is actually an example of something I tried to make really complicated. We moms are very busy people. You know that. We talked about that at the very beginning. Everybody's busy. So why not pick a book study or a program that has set guidelines? You could take a popular book and go chapter a chapter a week or a chapter every two weeks. By doing that, you minimize the amount of planning needs and the time that is needed to plan it and pull it off. The other thing, and I see books coming out like this all the time, is to have a set time commitment. The mom's group I referred to earlier was, I want to say it was a 10-week time commitment, but it was a set number of weeks. That was it. That's the commitment you put in. So it's easier to look ahead and go, okay, I don't have to do this for the rest of my life. It's just for the next six weeks, the next 10 weeks, the next four days, whatever it is. 
And finally, don't reinvent the wheel. There are so many great Catholic resources out there for moms that you don't have to think it up. You really just need to find somebody with the passion, and it may, you probably are that person because you're here. Now to bring it back around to another resource for, parish, for parishes. Young and expectant parents present an opportunity. And having worked in the parish office and scheduled a fair share of baptisms, uh, weddings and then baptisms so many months later, and uh, we come from an area where a lot of people have grown up and then we end up seeing them when they get married and then we see them when they come back to have their babies baptized. And there's a certain temptation at least in my life, to roll my eyes ever so slightly. Like, oh great, here they are, they're coming back for the sacraments. But I think we are called to turn that around a little bit and not be snarky about it. And that's, that's my own personal challenge, and I don't know, you might not have that challenge. But what if we think of them the way, and I just heard our, our pastor use this comparison not too long ago in an RCIA class. What if we think of them the way that the father in the story of the prodigal son was. There was the father, and in that culture, you know, the father of the prodigal son really should have just pretended he was dead. Well, not should have, but that's what cultural norms would have had him expecting. But what does he do? He runs. He sees the dust coming from his son's heels, and he's taken off running for him, and he embraces him. These parents with new children, with babies preparing for baptism are really an opportunity. These are moms who are unsure of themselves, even if it's their 15th kid. Every pregnancy has a certain measure of uncertainty, a certain measure of suffering along with it. And who better to carry you, support you, and encourage you through that than your parish family? So these, these parents preparing for baptism are an opportunity. So I encourage you to go beyond the baptism class. Go beyond, here's what you need to do to get the kid baptized and to move along. Engage them. Invite those young mothers in. And huh, I know just the book for them. OK, I'm kidding. You, you should know the book, too. But really, this is what I really want to come across and say is it's a chance to love them. And really, that's, that's the example we're called to give, especially from the parish office. Um, I think all too often I've heard people sound pleasantly surprised when they call a parish office and have a cheerful voice on the other end. Because I know it, it's really easy to get overwhelmed, and it's really easy to uh, feel a little unappreciated and overwhelmed. Did I say overwhelmed already? <laughs> so that said, I'm ready for the good part of the presentation, which is your questions. So. Hopefully there are some questions, or I can just make up my own. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to take control back over here to me. Thank you so much for your presentation. As Sarah said, now is the time for questions. So if you could find in your GoToWebinar questions section of the GoToWebinar panel, and we'll field questions now. So I'll go ahead and point, point those into the question, into the, uh, question section, and I'll, and I'll feed them to Sarah as we go along. So Sarah, the first question is, can parishes rely on volunteers or child care for child care, or should they hire someone, in your opinion? Oh, um, <laughs> depends on your budget, I guess. I guess the first consideration I would say would be to get a feel for what works best in your parish. I mean, budgetary, I can tell you if that question came up in my parish, our financial person would laugh and say, it's going to have to be volunteer run. I don't think that's always the answer. We, I think most parishes around the country now have the protecting God's children requirements, so you're going to have to have that involved. Depending on how many, how many, um, families or programs you're looking at, uh, having someone hired to do that, or to coordinate it might be, uh, what do I want to say, advantageous. On the other hand, when you have volunteers involved with that, like I found 
we have what we call the parish grandmas, and they really delight in other people's little kids in a way that I look forward to doing myself someday when I don't have little kids. So there might be a group of people within your parish who would enjoy serving in that capacity. So it might be a chance to give them a chance to serve. I guess I don't really have a yes or no answer to that. Good. No, that's great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Barbara asks, what, what kind of topics are, most of, are of most interest to mom groups? I think it depends on the mom group. The moms group I was a part of really seems to have no interest in theological issues, and I'm sort of a Catholic nerd, so I found myself a little bit at odds. We always tell people who are forming groups in our parish um, to start with what they're interested in because they will have a passion for it. I realize there's sort of a fallacy in saying that because what if I'm interested in how a Lego building block system will make a cathedral and no one else is interested in it. So I guess that's something you have to discern for your own group. I would say that raising children, keeping your faith, if you have a bunch of people who like to read in your parish, there might be an interest in a book study of some sort. I think we're all interested in learning to pray better, or better being a word in quotes. Thank you. Michelle asks, how would you suggest a mother's group get started? Parish-wide invite or, or small group by invitation that grows over time? What would, what's in your experience what works best? The things I see succeeding and the things I feel called to be part of myself, too, are things where I get a personal invitation. So whether it's an email that I can tell isn't all copied and pasted in a form email, but like, hey, Sarah, would you like to consider being part of our a mom's group we're going to form? I think um, starting it on a smaller scale and planting those seeds well is a more solid way of doing it. That said, within most parishes, you're probably going to need to get your pastor's approval or buy-in of some kind. So you're going to have to, if you're not in the parish office already, you're probably going to need to clue them in that you're doing something like that. But I think we all sort of, well, I'm speaking for a large group and I don't know that it's absolutely true. I find myself growing weary of large group things, like can we just have four or five people around the table? So you could start more than one at a time, too, if you had a lot of interest. We actually had that question as well. As, um, how many people would you suggest? Um, how many, how groups, how large would you like groups to be? I, I think, I, I, my personal opinion is that 10 people would be the max, but I was in a group of 12 and I felt like it was about two times too big. So keeping it under 10 for sure. If you're doing a small group type study, I think it's just hard to have a personal connection with each person if it's larger than that. That said, you can do successful groups that are larger than that too. It just, I think you probably need to see a couple of organizers in there, but I don't know that I'm an expert on any of, <laughs> any of that, but I would start smaller and it gives people the chance to be more intimate. When you're in a group of 20 people, you might not share, and they might not share. I definitely have the capacity to sit quietly and play on my iPad the entire time if it's a group of 20, whereas I wouldn't get away with that at all in a group of six. Okay, we have a great comment. So, so Cora makes a comment about their, their session. She says that they... Uh, they end each session with the, the children praying a decade of the rosary. Can you think of some other ways in which um, you can involve children into the meeting, Sarah? Oh, that's awesome. I end my PSR classes that way. And when we are rushed for time, the kids ask for the decade of the rosary. Uh, you could also have um, intentions go around and is there someone you would like to pray 
four, um, kids will have a way of bringing up what is closest to people's hearts, and uh, sometimes in a way that's embarrassing, so be mindful of that. You know, having, nobody ever wants to sing out loud, but if you have kids around, who cares what you sound like, right? Because they love to sing, so I would say you could involve some singing. Um, I will never suggest crafts, but if you are the kind of person who can handle crafts, kids love that, and it seems that most women do too. So I am just sort of the anti-craft, which is better than being the anti-Christ, right, Jared? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Sorry, I could not resist. Um, Amy asks, what types of things have you seen um, in a ministry, in a, in a parish ministry specifically to pregnant mothers? Um, I guess the question is asking, what, what kinds of things can parishes do to support pregnant, pregnant mothers? All right, I'm going to give the party answer first, and you have to answer <laughs> this tongue-in-cheek, okay? The, the, everybody here better be chuckling. You can give them my book. Okay, I've said it. That said, I have not, our parish does not do this. And that said, I need to get in there. I know if I go in there and say, hey, we should do this, they're going to look at me and go, okay, Sarah, and they're going to pull my own line on me, which is, that's a great idea. How are you going to do it? You know, kind of putting it back on me. I think there are ways... Um, Having groups of pregnant women meet, uh, most of, I mean, they might be working, they might be, you could use the baptism preparation time as a time to gather names and addresses, ask them if they, email addresses, you know, as well as physical addresses, you probably have that stuff in your parish database already. Um, Starting, why not start a mom's group with people who are expecting new babies or right after their new babies are born, um, offering them, you know, would you like a date night? You know, remember what it's like to wash your hair. Although that would take a special sort of uh, commitment on the parish's part. I'm sort of just brainstorming here. Um, no, that's good. Yeah, we actually have a couple. Wouldn't, wouldn't mind seeing an email with that question and then, <laughs> you know, starting a conversation somewhere where I can get some feedback back and forth on that because I feel like I'm talking to myself. No, that's maybe great. No, I'll, I'll kind of feed you some of the, the comments people are making. That, that'll be, hopefully, maybe that'll, that'll help. Um, Mr. Coro again says that they have a, a meals on, we are, not meals on wheels, but meals for moms when they return home. And yeah. we actually, I'm not a Catholic dad, but, but we just had. Um, our third child, and definitely was a big, big help from our parish to get a kind of a meal organized. Yeah, you know, organized. I'm, I'm totally, we call it our Martha's Meals Ministry. Yeah. Maybe I mentioned it in the book, or maybe I didn't, but no, we do that too. I just, I, I haven't gotten an alert in a while about That's, it, but no, yeah. whenever a baby is born, we get an email, and then you, yeah. That's a huge help right there. Food. Take them food. Absolutely. And there, there's like all kinds of websites out there that, that will help um, organize those kinds of things. Um, Tara also points out that they had an intimate mass for expectant mothers in their parish. And it made them feel very welcome to join their mom's group afterwards. So thanks, Tara, for sending that comment in. Um, some more questions that are coming in, so bear with me while I sift through them. Uh, Sarah, what do you think about Tara, multi? To... What do you think about? Go ahead. Go ahead. You have a comment. Yeah, I was going to say, Tara, if you could uh, email me or contact me, I'd like to hear more about that mass. Yeah. Cool. So, okay. Go ahead. Uh, what do you think about? What do you think about multi generational moms or, or women's groups, and what are some of the pros and cons of a more mature women meeting with younger moms? pro side as a young mom myself is awesome. I get to glean some insight. Um, a con I've noticed in my work in the parish is that some of the more mature moms I know have sort of a cynical or a negative view, or it feels like they do. Like they are done and they are finished and I'll talk to you later. I got to go do this other stuff. And maybe they don't intend to come off that way. And actually I'm quite sure they don't because they're women I know well. But there are times as a young mom myself when, you know, you wonder, is that light at the end of the tunnel the train that's going to run me over, or is it the path out of here? So I think there's an opportunity for those older moms to really be the support for the younger moms. And even if you're a younger mom with more kids, sometimes you can be that support for 
the other younger mom who's slightly younger than you having, you know, their first kid or whatever. Because it, it seems overwhelming. It's very easy for parenthood in general to be overwhelming. I mean, a kid gets sick and there goes your plan for the day. So I think there are pros and cons. Um, our, our parish tried to put together a mature moms uh, group. And I think they had some mixed success on it. Because the thing I've noticed is everybody assumes that once your kids are grown, you have all this free time. But I don't know anybody busier than the retired people in my parish. So I think it's like sort of a false expectation we have that we're going to have all this free time someday, and someday never comes. So I think it's good to mix ages. I tend to be the kind of person who enjoys being around those older moms, um, mature moms, if you will. Uh, but I also enjoy the chance to encourage younger moms, too. So I, I think there, there are pros and cons. Did I answer the question? I think so. I think so. That you, you probably had some discussion about it. That's perfect. Um, we have a question about, you, met, you talked a little bit about um, parents bringing their children back for the kind of the sacraments. Can you go into more detail how and how to get parents um, to continue to be involved after baptismal preparation or baptism class? Well, I can. <laughs> I don't know that all these ideas will work. Something I'm seeing working in my own PSR class um, is I sort of stand outside the room and collar them as they bring them in to PSR class. But those are parents who are already bringing their kids in. So that doesn't address those people who bring their kids in for baptism. And then where'd they go? Um, are you touching base with them? And I guess if you have 5,000 families in your parish, the answer is probably no. Are you offering classes for how to deal with a toddler? I guess classes aren't always the answer, but there, you know, there's a series of supports you could offer, theoretically, to support those parents where they are in their parenting. You know, what to do, is it time to have kid number two? Or is this not a conversation we should have? Have you offered NFP classes in your parish? And does anybody in your parish know what NFP stands for, except for the people who do the bulletin? And I mean, I think talking about NFP and getting that discussion out there does tap into some of those people within that age group. Once they get close to First Communion, you start to see the parents come back. And I think between the First Communion and the Confirmation age, you do have a chance to engage parents. I always invite parents to be part of my PSR class. and when I do that, I'm being sneaky. Don't, don't get me wrong, but don't tell them this, because I know that many of those parents think I have secret special powers, and I don't. I don't know anything more about the Catholic faith than they do, even though I'm a convert. The difference is that I geek out on Catholic stuff, and they probably have to run their kids to all the stuff that cause they have older kids than I do. And I'll be in that place someday. I know that. But having parents be part of my class gives them a chance to hear it the same way their kids are. I also touch base with my parents by email. I think you don't want to spam the people in your parish by emailing them constantly. But there are definite ways we could be putting information out there in the places they are, uh, whether it's social media or the website or in their inbox or little flyers they take home. I mean, if you have a beautiful parish bulletin, that's another resource to use as well. Great, thank you. Emory asks um, about a comment. You, you mentioned getting beyond the church doors. Can you explain what you meant by that? In theory, I mean, everybody who's a staff member should have lunch off site with somebody who's not a staff member. Um, I think it's all too easy, once, especially when, once I was a parish employee, to just totally geek out on my Catholic faith and forget that there are people who, A, don't know what the heck this sign of the cross means. And that's okay. It's, I mean, I don't hold that against them. But it's easy to forget the viewpoint of the people who aren't, that, who, for whom church is not life. Like, when, the, when you work in the parish, church is your life. I am working two bulletins ahead. I'm living in a different place in our parish than probably almost anybody else in our parish. And it's easy to forget that the guy who opens the door as the usher at Mass is not so consumed with parish life as I am. So I think 
as parish employees, as people who are highly involved in our parishes, we need to get beyond our church doors or our church office doors, or I work from home, my screen. I need to get up out of my chair and walk through the doors and go meet people. And whether it's at mass, whether it is over lunch, whether it's a play date, somehow we have to be touching the flesh, as they say. And I mean, you can also use the multimedia aspect to do it as well, but I think we have to get beyond that comfort zone, if you will, of what we do within the parish and what we know and why, doesn't, why don't people come to us. There are lots of places they can go. We need to get up and go to them and invite them and be that representative of Christ that they're looking for. Good, thank you. Uh, trying to find the question I just had. So, um, the question was, and if I can find it, the question was basically asking for um, some advice for for groups of moms that are planning. Uh, so they might be meeting the, the week before the week before the moms group session. What are some um, it, what do you? What kind of advice? What are some advice that you have for them planning topics? Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. What are other resources? What other resources do you recommend for planning committee to come up with meeting topics? That's from Maribel. Thank you. Do you mean topics like things to study, or do you mean a general approach to planning? Maybe actually, maybe a little bit of both. I think that would be good to get maybe a two-part yeah. question. Then we'll say one is, is what are some advice do you have on how to plan, maybe how to organize the planning okay. sessions, and then two, um, where could these, right. like, where can they go to brainstorm topics or find topics to talk about? I'll, I'll take it from a two-part approach then. So on the planning side, I would say first of all, um, if the group of moms that are planning share some similar traits, and at least one trait they share is that they're passionate enough about their faith to form a group about it, you have to remember that the people who are meeting with you might not share that passion. And that, this is something I'm very guilty of myself, that you might scare them away with your zeal and your passion. So you might have to, if you're anything like Sarah Reinhard, tone it down just a notch. Not let the enthusiasm go away, just don't scare them away by being Sarah Reinhard. That's, that's my first advice on the planning. The second thing it's the center you're planning very much around God's will, the Holy Spirit, begin and end with prayer. I know these are basic things, and you are probably already doing them. There's something I need to constantly remind myself of, because when I start to think that Sarah can do it, because Sarah's got a great plan, and Sarah can figure all this out, man, nothing is going to make me crash faster. And the bad thing about when I say crash faster, it'll be a nice, slow, miserable crash, not a fast, get it over quick crash. So I would say in your planning, be very cognizant of the fact that you might care more than they do about certain things, but you share that common bond of being moms. So you have that in common. So tap into that. Um, as far as topics go, I mean, you need to only look at the fall release of, of course, of Ave Maria Press, but all of the publishers, I mean, I've got a stack of review books sitting right beside me here that are incredible. You could go through any of those books as a group of moms and pull out anything. Um, you could take the Year of Faith website. The USCCB has, a, if you Google Year of Faith, because I've done this recently to try and find this link for our parish bulletin, one of the first hits is... Um, the USCCB site, but then the Vatican has a Year of Faith website as well. And there are links to all these resources. You could just go through, just today, somebody sent me a link. It's for a blog called Catholic Moms Talk. And her whole premise behind this blog is to have Catholic moms talk about how they're, during the Year of Faith, they're using the catechism. Of course, this person invited me to be a contributor, and I said yes, so now I have to figure out how to use the, the catechism in the Year of Faith. <laughs> Um, great way to force myself into doing something for the year of faith with my family, isn't it? Um, so, you know, start with the cat. Why not use the catechism as a topic? I mean, you could go through the catechism and you don't have to tell them you're using the catechism. Better yet, you could use the UCAT, which I recommend if you don't, if you haven't already seen the UCAT, check it out. I use it with the young people, fifth and eighth grade that I work with in our parish. But I also make sure their parents hear me say, you should have one of these in your house. 
doesn't replace the catechism, but it it's more access it's accessible in a different way, and it gets you it cross references to the catechism very well uh, for people who maybe have a higher uh, or a lower what do I want to say they, they have a threshold right so they might not be as familiar with Catholic teaching or whatever as you might be as the planner so you want to meet them where they are without scaring them off so using a resource like that maybe taking a topic from the catechism and going okay how does this look um, take a book in the Bible and find a good commentary and distill it down that's making some work for you but I mean how many times have you thought I should read the Bible more well pick up the Bible and read it together I mean out loud and then pray I don't know that that helps but no I, I think and you said a minute ago it seems basic but I think um just adding prayer to those meetings, but I think it's so important because when, when you're working in parish ministry or you're, you're a part of those committees, it, it can be a tendency to just get right down to business. And I think that's a great reminder that, that if, if, if not with prayer, how, how else can it succeed, right? Um, good. So the, everyone's saying, starting to say thank you. And, and, and um, just I'll ask one last question before we wrap things up. And it's asking about, um, you mentioned a little bit, you mentioned encouragement. What are some other ways you can offer encouragement to um, young mothers? Well, I think the thank you notes tied in. Um, I have gotten, this is going to sound crazy, and you're going to go, really, Sarah? My kids, especially the kid who is the current toddler, has a special talent for making me feel like maybe the sacrifice of the Mass is me during Mass. And um, just recently, I've started referring to Mass as my own personal rodeo because I'm, like, trying to keep him still. I'm trying to keep him occupied. But I can't tell you how many times over the course of the last eight years since I have had babies and toddlers in Mass, I've had, especially during one of those Masses that I think, did that even count for anything, for anybody? Did, like, my kids screamed so loud, perhaps. We all lost our hearing. And I've had older, usually it's older moms, mind you, who come up to me and say, I was praying for you during Mass when she was acting up like that. Or, you did great. Or they might even just wink at me. But that little act that they did, you know, right after Mass or even during Mass, I had a woman one time just sort of grab the baby from me and soothe him. And I'm like, how did you do that? But those little acts of just sort of being present to your parish family, that's a huge encouragement, especially when you have the little kids. I, there are versions of that with teenagers, too, but I have a feeling Jared's trying to cut me off because we're out of time. No, I, I, I'll second that as a parent with young kids. It, it's great to have that and kind of it's okay to have your kids screaming because you can't necessarily control that. Um, well, I had, yeah. you know, our deacon's wife told me, um, when my first one was little, so of course it was much worse with the first one because you think maybe your world has in fact ended. Um, the deacon's wife came up to me and said, isn't it funny how they always fuss during the consecration? It's like they know it's more important. Exactly. And I just, I have never looked at the consecration the same way again. And I mean, she gave me a great gift when she said that to me, but she could have just laughed. She could have just smiled at me and waved and left. I mean, we're not that small of a parish that she couldn't have escaped me, but she took the time to come up to me. And I think, you know, Especially when we work in the parish, we have an authority to what we say. And it's something I struggle with sometimes because I want to blow off steam. But when you work in your parish or you volunteer a great deal in your parish, you have an authority and people listen to what you say with a different weight to it. And when you encourage them, that encouragement has a different weight to it too. And I think being mindful of that, you can give great gifts and great support to these moms in your parish who really are hungry for it. Father Kyle writes LOL when you made the comment about the consecration. I think that's great. <laughs> he said LOL because he's never thought of saying it that way before or because um, that's his life. <laughs> oh, it, it'll be a mystery, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, thank you. For those of you who want to, would like to order a copy of Sarah's new book, either for yourself or for moms in your parish, you can do so at AveMariaPress.com. Um, as a gesture for, for attending this webinar, you can get a 20% off um, discount using the webinar, excuse me, using the coupon code webinar 10, 
nine or one zero nine for today's date. Um, just make sure you add the promo code in the promo box, promo code box, and click apply when you order. And that offer ends on October sixteenth or next Tuesday. I, I have two other quick announcements. Those of you who follow Sarah's blog or, or CatholicMom.com know that she is in the midst of a 20-day blog tour for Catholic moms in honor of Mary during this month of the Rosary. So check out her blog at SnoringScholar.com or the Ave Maria Press news page for more details about that. Something she mentioned a lot of, if you're looking for resources, that this tour is going on to a lot of um, websites and blogs that I think moms in your parishes would, would love to be able to have access to. And second, Sarah also mentioned the new series, CatholicMom.com Books. Um, the CatholicMom.com book series is set to include books written by Lisa Hendy, the founder of CatholicMom.com, and her fellow moms and bloggers like Sarah to celebrate all things faith, family, and fun from a thoroughly Catholic perspective. And you can find out more about this series at AveMariaPress.com slash CatholicMomBooks. If you're not already connected to Ave Maria, Press on, Ave Maria Press Online, you can find us on Facebook or Vimeo or YouTube, where we'll have the recording of this webinar posted later on this week. And bookmark the page AveMariaPress.com slash webinar hyphen videos for this recording and all recordings of past webinars. I'd like to thank our partners, the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the National Federation of Priest Councils, once again, for their partnership in this series. If you're not familiar with these organizations, please check out their websites and Facebook pages. Finally, please mark your calendars for the next webinar in the Professional Development Series. On Tuesday, October 16th, Lori Dahlhoff from NCEA will explore the meaning of the new evangelization and how it's part of fostering discipleship through religious education. This is an important topic um, dealing with the year of faith, which begins later on this week. So thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and please join us again next week.